excited. We are a little bit excited uh, that we have Maxine Benneba Clark about to come on stage. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping first. I need to welcome you to the Wheeler Centre. Those who've just come in, that's okay. You've missed an hour and a half <laughs> of fun, of games. We all came up here and did a little act. What you did was terrific, but I think we should keep it between us. Uh, but I should say, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wheeler Centre as part of the Melbourne City Reads celebrating Maxine Benneber clarks new poetry collection, How Decent Folk Behave. That deserves a round of applause. But not yet. Okay, that was good. That was, you went, you travelled, thank you, you travelled from a 7 to an 8.5. And that was appropriate. It will need to go to nine, though, in a moment. Uh, I would like to acknowledge, of course, tonight's conversation is taking place on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders of all communities on these lands. And that deserves another hand. Uh, I'd like to let you know that this conversation is part of the Melbourne City Reads initiative presented by the Wheeler Centre and supported by the City of Melbourne, the Victorian Government and ABC Radio Melbourne. That can be another little... <laughs> Gee, you're very good. Would you come to all my gigs? Oh, look at you. You're just a ray of light. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Maxine Benneber clark is the author of over 10 books for adults and children, including the memoir, The Hate Race, the short fiction collection, Foreign Soil, and the picture book, When We Say Black Lives Matter. How Decent Folk Behave is her fourth poetry collection. Now, that is the typically understated and beautifully humble description that Maxine gave me. I said I would do my own. <laughs> and I'm delighted to. Uh, but seriously, as someone who has admired her work over the years, I would describe Maxine as a poet of wonderful intensity. Her poems jump off the page with truth and reality, with beauty and a sense of wonder, but when a seeker of truth and equality and decency is confronted by some of the tragic realities that we fall, that we, we embrace and that we, uh, we fall well short of what we deserve, the great ones step forward. We need thinkers and poets like Maxine. What a treat that she is yours for the next 60 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Maxine Banaba clark <laughs> it worked! Yeah. So, oh, look, there we are. I said to Maxine, if you don't mind, we might go a little show busy. <laughs> you were okay with that. I was instructed. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> gee, I'm, I'm jumping around here, but I'm going to jump straight to your mum, who was an actress. And yes. I wondered if there was a little bit of uh, the world of the theatre that has rubbed off on you. Yeah, I think definitely. You know, I grew up, you know, um, kind of in the wings, I suppose. Yeah. You know, my parents came to Australia in 1976. And my mum went to drama school there, um, their equivalent. In London. Of, yeah. yeah. I kind of came here and there weren't many roles for her, obviously, in 1976 on the Australian stage. Yes. Um, Cross-cultural casting wasn't really a thing, but, you know, every now and then she'd kind of get something and we'd end up after school hanging out in the wings of some show or other. And, Do you remember um, any of them? Yeah, I remember. I mean, look, <laughs> she did The Crucible several times. <laughs> uh, she Arthur did To Miller. Kill a Mockingbird several times. Oh, you know, really? these were the kinds of, I suppose, you know, roles that were available at that time. But I remember being forced to read lines with her, yeah. <laughs> which I think given I turned to spoken word um, yeah. as an early poet is an interesting development. And, and those plays, I mean, The Crucible and To Kill a Mockingbird, both plays of 
uh, of the heart and, and big topics, were they discussed at home in terms of, you know, what they were, were saying? I mean, I think when I would read scripts with her, you know, I'd kind of say, what's this scene about? Or, you know, what, where is this set? And things like that. And we'd have a discussion about it. But I don't think overtly. I think it was kind of almost the, the work was enough. Yes. You know, I mean, they're both incredibly nuanced works yes, that course. deal with prejudice and, and things like that. So I think it's almost this kind of process of os- osmosis. Yeah. And when you're reading lines, you know, it's not like reading a book, you're kind of reading the same scenes over and over again. Um, you, you, you know, it's something that you, you can't not think about. Um, you of know, course. This, yeah. Of course. I love, there's a great description that I came across where you talked about uh, your mum and dad and you said there was a lot of uh, velour there were bell bottoms and there were turtleneck (laughs) jumpers. What did they think of you becoming a writer? I mean, I think, you know, my mum kind of followed her dream and then lost her dream in terms of acting. Although, if you have kids and you saw the um, touring production of Possum Magic in 2019, she was Grandma Poss. So, (laughs) or if you've seen that kind of Woolies ad where they talk about things being green, she kind of pops up on there. Right. Um, So she does kind of still do things, you know, even. um, But so she was very concerned with having another option. You know, so yes. when I kind of trotted off to uni, it was kind of, yeah, yeah, you can study poetry, but <laughs> you might want to study something else as well. Right. Um, but, yeah, I feel really lucky in that respect that I had, you know, a parent who was in the arts, who loved the arts and who really encouraged that as something to pursue, yeah. whether you managed to do it as a career yes. or not. Um, I think for a lot of migrant kids, that's not necessarily the reality when they say they want to be a poet. So Exactly. Yeah. Well, how wonderful. Um, I should have mentioned uh, where Maxine will... uh, She has bought the book, so there will be a couple of readings throughout our hour. And uh, she's also agreed to take questions from the floor at the end. So, you know, bear that in mind as you listen to us. Maxine, I've sort of... uh, I I have jumped around a little bit, but I, I will go back to... The question I wanted to start with where it's a quote, another quote from you. You describe poetry as the form I first fell in love with. Can you take us back to the beginning and and some of those poets and some of those poems? Yeah, I think, you know, the first poems that I was reading as a, I suppose, upper primary kid, lower high school kid, um, in addition to what I was reading in English class were... Um, you know, those wonderful liner notes that he used to get with cassettes and CDs. Oh, yes. Um, where, uh, you know, my dad had a really extensive record collection, so, yes. you know, hundreds and hundreds of records, and I'd kind of pull them out and I'd be reading, you know, Paul Simon and Bob Dylan and uh-huh. the Neville brothers. And, and to me, that, I think, was my first introduction to lyricism. Wow. It didn't really come from... Even though my parents had a lot of books in the house, they didn't actually have a lot of poetry. Um, And this is something I really only realised a few years ago when people started saying, but what were you reading growing up? You know, how did you come to poetry? And I think through those lyrics, they slowly transformed into, you know, dub poetry or reggae poetry or every now and then you get an album, you know, like James Brown's song Heroin King, which is essentially a spoken word piece. Um, And so, yeah, that was my first introduction to... Poetry, I and, suppose, and and some of those some of those liner notes. I came across an old copy of um, the first album I ever bought through the Australian Record Club, Bob Dylan's Highway sixty one revisited, mm. and I had a look at it the other day. And the liner notes on the back are extremely surreal. Mm. I think it was around the time that he was uh, writing his his first book. Very abstract, very influenced by the beat poets, you know, the Ginsbergs and the mm. Kerouacs. So you were getting a sense of the, the liner notes, but as you say, also the lyrics. So who were the artists that you were drawn to? Oh, you know, Tracy Chapman, Ben yeah. Harper, um, Angelique Kidjo, Bob Dylan, yeah. um, you know, even in terms of short fiction, you know, when I think about how I, r- I learnt to write a short story, things like um, Bob Dylan's Hurricane, 
you know, which is essentially this incredible description of, yeah. of you know, what happened to Ruben Carter or um, Paul Simon's Me and Julio down by the schoolyard, you know, that's kind of this incredible yeah. telling of this thing that happened, this moment of kind of fictional testifying. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that those things, the ability to do something extraordinary in such a tiny, tiny amount of space, yes. um, you know, in three minutes was kind of, yeah, I think quite a revelation. So what about your first writing then? Was there, was there poems at, at high school or were there, were there short stories at, at secondary school? Oh, it was all terrible, you know, <laughs> as it always is. I often wish that, you know, I had some of my old... I mean, I was getting great marks for it, but it was terrible, you know. Um, Terrible. You know, and angst-ridden yeah, and, and you right. know nothing about the world. So all of your characters are these, you know, stereotypical, cliched beings. You know, I think that's the case with, you know, a lot of young writers, you know, when you yeah. don't know much about the world. But I loved, you know, when I say I fall in love with poetry or I fell in love with poetry first, that, you know, just that the essence of being a writer, sitting down, arranging words, realising that you can make something sound beautiful or you can make it sound terrible yes. and that you can evoke these emotions yeah. um, with words. You know, I think that reading poetry and writing poetry was kind of the first time I went, oh, okay, this is... You know, yeah. this is a way to speak to the world, a really effective way to speak to the world. And what about the first thing that you wrote that really you felt uh, you'd, you'd created something that you would be proud of? Although I suppose when you're, you're young, you're proud of what you're writing. Yeah. But even now, yeah. maybe with hindsight, looking yeah. back. I think the first thing like that, I mean, I did, I went off and I studied creative writing at university and I wrote a lot of stuff that was still terrible. And then I got involved with this actually theatre company that was a local theatre company running out of Parramatta and they yeah. were called Hook, Line and Sinker. And as kind of fledgling theatre companies come and go, you know, they kind of folded after about five years. But they did this series of monologues and I wrote this monologue called The Boy in the Room Next Door which was this story about a girl who loves hip-hop falling in love with this boy in the room next door that loves techno music. Um, <laughs> and it really was just an extended poem, you know, yeah. about her kind of hating this music and then growing to love the music. And, and that's the first thing that I kind of thought, I can do this. You know, I can write an extended narrative and I can, you know, wield words this way. I think we had a short run at Parramatta Riverside Theatres or something like that, wow. two nights or something. And you performed the piece? Yeah, I performed it. And, um, I mean, it was really almost like a slam poem. There wasn't yeah. much acting involved per se. Um, but, yeah, it was kind of, yeah, that ability to hear the work and also to see people receiving it. I think that's the wonderful thing about spoken word is you can see whether it works. Oh, yeah. You can also see when it fails. Yes. <laughs> it's one of the drawbacks. But, but yeah. you get a sense yeah. from the energy of the audience. And mm. I think even if you just read it aloud to one person, you get a sense mm. of, well, that line works or that line needs mm. some work. Yeah. We'd, we'd better hear one. I, I, <laughs> I asked Maxine, would she sort of scatter a few poems throughout our uh, our time. Which one should I read? Well, <laughs> I reckon you've got to start with the prologue. So start maybe we get, prologue. we get to... Because oh the prologue, it really serves notice. Ooh. Prologue. I said, get the fuck back. I am warning you. I've got poetry. Their hands were trembling. Their eyes were wild, and I could smell their fear. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I, just, I just think it's such a great way to begin a book that, that, or, or a collection of poetry. And I mentioned in my intro, you, you don't hold back. You, you, you're, you're seeing the world as it is, and... You're, you're jumping in head first, so beautiful. Can we have one more? <laughs> Let's go. I'll read a longer one. This is the second poem in the book, or the first after the prologue, um, and it's titled When the Decade Broke. 
The stroke of midnight, December 31st, 1999, was going to end the world. At the hospital, they brought generators in. Even the food service staff were kept till late evening. None of us would get to, ah, at the most expensive fireworks on earth, lighting up a new century. If the power cut out, we planned to spend Armageddon pigging out on defrosting Sarah Lee and handing out the bottled water down in maternity. We would control the food, we joked, and therefore everything. In the new century, we, the workers, would be king. Just like one day we'll say, where were you on December 31st, 2019? And most importantly, who were you? before the decade turned. Don't look at me like that. You know what I mean. Who were you when thunder was made of our protesting children's feet? When 45, the then president of the United States of America had just been impeached? We'll say to young ones, unthinkable now, isn't it? That back then in this city, women's bodies were sometimes found naked from the waist down we would gather in the parks for candlelight vigils. That in this very place, the decade before revolution came, nobody led, though four prime ministers rose and fell. Innocent black folk were shot at point blank range regularly across the world and often incarcerated for no valid reason at all. Don't avert your eyes from mine. You should know what this place was. Earth on fire from the redwoods of California to Australia's east coast. My God, the furnaces that burned. In Brazil, they lost a good part of the Amazon. The sea drew back and tsunamis lashed out in Samoa and Sumatra. The water rose in Sulawesi and Nagasaki. In the new decade, we will say, the world was not always this beautiful way. In some countries... Small children starved to death every single day. But all that slowly started to change and powerful men were brought to trial for heinous acts of hate. We threw them out and re-legislated. They'd made the churches far more powerful than the state. For a good while there, we thought we were doomed, that it was all just way too late. But the decade turned. The decade turned and suddenly, we were wide awake, lined along the gunpowdered foreshore, faces tilted to the sky, watching revolution break. Wow. I'm going to jump again because I think after hearing that, and, and particularly in tandem with the prologue, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your, your process, which is a, a really just a fancy word for, for saying how do you do it. Are you, t tell us, a, can, maybe can you sketch out for us uh, an average session, and there may not be an average session, for writing for you? Yeah, I think for me, every poem, by the time I come to write it, I've thought about it for weeks. You know, it's really? kind of this sense of... And I think that comes partly from when I was, I guess, starting out in my writing career, having very young children. So limited time to sit down and take notes, yep. often not having a notebook with me and thinking, oh, you know, there's that really poignant image and yes. I really want to, you know, come back to it. Yeah. And so I think about it, you know, whether you're lying in bed or sitting watching a swimming class or something like that. Um, and then so when I come to, I suppose, actually putting something down on paper, it's just that brain dump of images of, you know, the, or, or sometimes, you know, this is what I want to try and get across, yes. you know, whether it's a feeling. Um, and I often, I'm a very spare writer, you know, there aren't many edits that get chucked over the really? shoulder. Um, there'll be things, that, a lot of things that get changed and moved around. Yeah. Um, and I think also partly it comes from being... Um, drawn to spoken word in the beginning that that process, I guess what people often see is the writerly process of actually sitting there at the keyboard, um, to me is not necessarily the starting point. 
you know, it might be how a sentence sounds or it might yep. be, um, yeah, just the rhythm. I want it to have a particular rhythm to this particular poem and the rhythm might come before the actual yes. images. Yeah. I've heard of some writers and, and in fact, songwriters who will often go for long walks and, and the rhythm of their footsteps or they might jog and mm. they try and have a verse going the whole time yeah. to get that rhythm. I'm intrigued with that poem, yeah, how much of it did... How much do you tinker? Like, how different is that now, published, out in the world, compared to when you first wrote it? Yeah, I think when I first penned it, that kind of opening um, s image of the year 2000, you know, that kind of Y2K, the world is going to be destroyed, um, you know, which was such a big thing. I was, you know, 18 at the time and it was, you know, as an 18 year old, just excited, you know, <laughs> no yeah. one was worried. It was just kind of, what's going to happen at midnight? Yes. Um, and it just kind of felt like that. You know, these particular times almost feel like that. We're on, on the brink of catastrophe. But I, that only really occurred to me after I'd written the rest of the poem. So it was kind of collecting all these images about 2019. And of course, that poem was supposed to be, you know, like the entry into this amazing 2020 that we would have. Yes. <laughs> where all of these things were starting to change. And of course, it wasn't, yep. you know. Um, yep. And so, yeah, that kind of um, opening was only written later. Um, yeah. But then it kind of thought, no, it doesn't actually belong at the end of the poem. It belongs no. as an introduction to... Well, yeah. we're, we're instantly hooked because we all know, most of us, you know, where we were mm. on that night. We remember this idea of what is going to happen. Will everything crash? Mm. Will it be a complete nightmare? So, so we're in there. On a mundane level, and I say mundane, <laughs> but it's always fascinating to me... Uh, Pencil or pen on paper or or computer, straight into computer? Pen and paper with poetry, okay. which is strange because everything else I tend to start... I might jot notes down on paper, yep. but I don't start the actual writing unless it's kind of a you know on the computer, on Microsoft Word okay. or whatever. But poetry, it always has to be pen and paper and I don't quite know why that is. Right. Um, and it's, you know, it's often I'll write something and go to bed and look at it the next morning and I can't read half of it. You know, yeah, it's that right. kind of, <laughs> yeah. let me get something down. And then it's like, well, I may as well not have written anything right. down. Cause <laughs> and, um, and silence yeah. or, or do you like music on when you're writing or? Um, I'm, not, I'm not, fast. not fast. I mean, I don't love complete silence just because I guess I've always worked in the gaps of life. Um, and so... That's kind of there's always something going on, yeah. um, and it's funny. I used to write at night because you know I had young kids and they were at home, and unless they're having a nap, you know yeah. there was no time. So I'd write from kind of you know eight p.m. to one or two in the morning, and it's really difficult to break that habit. Yes. Um, and in fact, my son said to me the other night. Um, I think it was 12 o'clock or something, he got up to go to the bathroom. He said, oh, you're still up? And he said, I remember years ago I'd get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you'd still be up, you know, working. And, you know, that hasn't happened for a while. And he said, I thought that was normal. Like, we'd, I'd talk to my friends and they'd say, what time do your parents go to bed? <laughs> I'd say, my mum's, you know, goes She's to up. bed at 2 a.m. Um, so it's it slowly changed, but it's still difficult to break that night yeah. writing habit, even though my free hours are now 9 to 3. Yeah. Um, I find myself faffing around and then still sitting down at eight o'clock to, yeah. to do something. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Also, I think there is something romantic about the, the midnight hour and everything outside is is quiet and, you know. Yeah, and the lack of interrupt, you know, no, the yeah. postie doesn't ring the doorbell yeah. and, you, don't, you know, no one's emailing you. and No, you know, it's kind another of eBay delivery yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coming tumbling in. Um, your first book or your first uh, collection of poetry, Nothing Here Needs Fixing, you released that in 2013. So that's eight years. I think, is this your fourth volume yeah, of poetry? Yeah, yeah. Do you ever look back at the poems in, in that first one? I know you, you mentioned before looking back at the things you would write as an adolescent. But what about the things you published in 2013? Yeah, you know, so the, the there was... 
a, a book before that, although it wasn't, it was a chat book, so it wasn't kind of officially, I wouldn't call it a collection, but it was called Gil Scott Heron is on Parole. Right. And then Nothing Here Needs Fixing was a, uh, um, you know, Gil Scott Heron was on Parole, the chat book was kind of quite eclectic. You know, yes. it's kind of, I wasn't producing much work, so I was like, here is everything I've written in the last five years. And then Nothing Here Needs Fixing was a very slim volume that kind of dealt with, um, being a single parent, you know, the title was about that idea of a broken home. You know, nothing here actually needs fixing. Yeah. Um, and when I... Um, so they were both published by Picaro Press. And Picaro Press was this tiny poetry press publisher. Um, when I say tiny, it was one guy, Rob Reel, who's done amazing things for Australian poetry, who had a printing, printing press in his garage in Warners Bay in New South Wales. Wow. So it was literally that was the scale of it. And um, around 2016, Auckland Writers' Festival asked me to come and be part of their festival. And they programmed me for six poetry sessions. So I kind of tried to contact Rob and said, look, we can finally start, you know, sell some of my books and he'd gone out of business. Oh. And so um, Hachette, who'd published Foreign Soil by then, said, well, let's look at both of those books and let's collect the best of those books right. and whatever new material you have and we'll make them into a volume, like a decent size. Yes. It's kind of slightly bigger than, than How Decent Folk Behave. Yeah. And that was carrying the world. And so that question of, I actually got the chance to leave, leave behind what I would never have published. <laughs> and it was a really interesting process. You know, I went through these books. The, that chat book, Gil Scott Heron, was on parole, was published in 2008. So this is 2016. So yeah. it's quite a long time. Yes. Um, and I'd say probably I left out, nothing here needs fixing, the entire book went in as one section because okay. I was actually quite happy with that. Uh, but Gil Scott Heron's on parole. I reckon we probably left out about, um, say, say there were 50 poems in there, we might have taken 30 of them. Wow. And so, you because know, that you was... Because you didn't feel they represented you? Yeah, I just, I thought I could, I could do better. I could do better. And it was the opportunity. It's kind of why republish them if I'm not that happy with yeah, them? I mean, those who have Gil Scott Heron is on parole have a piece of Maxine Benieba Clark history now. <laughs> 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 but, um, yeah, and it was a really fascinating process. Like, how do you decide? Because with all of my books... You know, sometimes with Foreign Soil, I'll go and do a school visit or something and ask me to read part of a story and I'll find myself cringing at a sentence, you know, yeah. almost kind of going, I would never write that this way. Yes. You always do that. Um, and so, yeah, there were poems that I think just didn't work, didn't quite work and probably I wasn't... Yeah. Um, I didn't have enough experience to realise at the time that they didn't quite yeah. work. Sometimes it was the nature of the poem. It was like, this just doesn't quite fit into this yes. new collection. Um, and, yeah, that was a really interesting... And that collection actually won the Victorian Premier's Award. And so, in the end, I was quite glad that I did a quite ferocious edit yeah. on let me look at my new stuff and what I'm happy with. And, yes. you know, you don't often get the chance. It does make you think what will happen, you know, ten years on... Yeah. <laughs> from yeah, this yeah, one, yeah. but yeah. I think probably you get to a point, a, a level of maturity mm. or a level of skill with, um, with your craft. I wanted to ask you about other writers you admired. You talked a little bit about uh, Nam Lee, Zadie Smith, Alice, Alice Pung. We both uh, confess that we adore Britt Bennett, mm. who wrote The Vanishing Half, and I told Maxine she has to read the one before, I think, The Mothers. Mm. But who are the writers who, who inspire you? Yeah, I think for me a lot of poets um, and people who I found through going down an internet rabbit hole almost. There's a, a New Orleans poet named Sunny Patterson. You have to go home and look her up. She's okay. kind of got a lot of stuff on YouTube. And, it's a she. Yeah. Yep. Um, and her work is just, oh, it's incredible. Um uh, Nikki Giovanni, who's an African-American poet. Um, she's older now. I'd say she's probably in her late 60s, early 70s. Um, Linton Kwesi Johnson, who's yeah. a black British reggae poet. Yep. Um, known for, most known for a poem titled Dread, Beat and Blood, which was the, the title of his first album. Uh, Benjamin Zephaniah, 
who's another black British Jamaican poet. So I guess I was looking at, you know, when I went away to university to study creative writing, it was very much the Western canon. Right. You know, I was kind of always pushing to, you know, can you give me something that's actually, um, you know, like reflects my background? Yes. Or, um, and of course, that's what you learn in a creative writing degree. You learn the history of Western literature. Um, and how and did they respond, of... your, your teachers or <laughs> the people who I mean, were... the, there was some kind of concession, I suppose, to, yes, okay, well, let's do... We studied the Negritude poets, Arme Césaire, the kind of... But kind of as a canon or a movement. Yes. Um, and, but it was kind of, if you wanted to learn, because I was within the creative arts faculty, you would go across to the English and you'd do a post-colonial literature. You right. know, you had to choose to, to study those yes. writers. Um, it wasn't kind of, these are just writers. It was like, they're black writers, so they're in the post-colonial stream. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so I kind of stumbled on a lot of people myself, just that rabbit hole of reading people's essays and one poet's essay would lead me to another poet and then that essay, you know, that kind yeah. of glorious method of discovery. Yes. Yeah, it is remarkable. Mm. We better hear another one. Uh. Um, I was wondering about the one that features the title. Okay, so that poem is Something Sure. That's right. Yeah. Something Sure. Sit down here now, baby. Stop that fidgeting. Listen big and understand. Mama's got to school you about something sure before you grow into a man. Now Hannah Clark, she died today. We don't know her from soap, it's true. She the one in the papers whose ex burn her up as she's driving the kids to school. Poured petrol on three little ones and killed those angels too. It hurts my heart to think on it, so baby, mama needs to know that a good man, the man you'll grow to be, can lead a bad man home. Do you know to say, nah, don't do that, mate? Well, that's not fucking right, you heard her. Take your hand off her shoulder and how about you and I call it a night? I know you're young, and I taught you well how decent folk behave. But if the time comes, every woman is your mama when it comes to saving. Like if she on the street and he smell like trouble, getting right up close and in her face. Or some colleague in the lunchroom saying, that damn bitch took my babies. If his veins all popping, fists all clenched, and his eyes are still as death. Will you call it out or call it in now, baby? Trust your gut and use your head. We women mostly got each other's backs, but sometimes busy, just surviving. Set up against the acid throwers, hands gripped round throats, locked doors and petrol fires. And every two minutes, the state is called to deal with domestic violence. But a boy like you could grow to make a difference if you try, like if you say, I'm going to make her pay, a man like you could remind him about the time the twins were born when he came in late and could not stop smiling, saying, man, her back was arched in agony, but she wasn't screaming, eh? Just got our bubs here safely. Shit, I won't forget today. See, Hannah and them kids died brutal. We don't know them all from soap. But it aches my soul to muse on it. So, babe, your mama needs to know that a good man, exactly the man you'll be, will lead a bad man home. It's, it's so powerful. One of the, the, the powerful moments in that for me, it, well, there's a whole lot, but but the questions that you ask. And I think that's really great. It suddenly, it turns it from being something that we listen to and instantly we're, we're thinking, well, okay, how, how do I talk to my son? How does, how does, how does a boy grow up? And, and how does one boy go one way and one boy go the other? I might be being too literal, but I'm assuming there's a bit of you and your family in there. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, when I wrote this poem, I was thinking of, you know, this idea that whenever we hear one of these stories, we think, 
you know, thank God that's not me. You know, as a woman, it's kind yeah. of like, thank God, and please let me never cr come across a man like that. Yeah. Um, but as a mother, you also think, please don't let me raise a man like that. Yes. You know, that these men are people's sons and people's brothers. And, and also that idea that it's a woman's responsibility, you know, that um, to actually kind of deal with the problem. So I suppose, you know, that... You know, I was thinking very much about how early we have these discussions with our children. Yeah. Um, and, you know, how to have that discussion so that you're not kind of saying all men are bad or you're yeah. going to grow up like this. Um, and, you know, what is your responsibility as a, a male human being on the planet to yeah. actually engage with what's happening and change yeah. that? So I think that's probably one of the few poems where I kind of sat down and had a specific, I want to talk about this issue. You know, I want to inject my feelings as the, the mother of a son, yep. but also want to offer something for people to go away with, you yeah. know, whether that's a man who's read the poem, whether that's a woman who wants to go away and talk to... The, the men in her life and say, look, are you, it's not enough to be a good man. A good man actually steps in yes. in front of a bad one. Um, yeah. Has your son read that poem? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, it's funny, I don't, you know, my, my, ki my daughter's actually in the audience tonight. But, um, yeah, I don't, my, my work is on the um, VCE syllabus at the moment. Um, and it's kind of getting towards that time where my son's in year 11 next year. Ah. And now ne uh, next year, the hate race and foreign soil are on the syllabus. So it's like he's dodging having to actually sit down and study it. But yeah, right. I think it's that awful thing where you, you don't want to... I, I think even with my mum when I used to go and watch her in plays, it's like you're not really watching. There's almost a part of you, even though you're watching, it's almost a part of you that's yeah. like, it's mum, I don't want to know, I'm not interested yeah. kind of thing. Oh, um, I saw her so in I the don't... kitchen this morning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She was exactly. really annoying. <laughs> yeah. So do I, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's very much kind of... I imagine he will have to read them at some time, yeah. so I'm not going to push them on him. <laughs> I hope he does, and I'm sure he will. Can I just quickly ask you about that phrase in there, uh, you don't, is it you don't know soap? What's the... We don't know her from soap. We don't know her yeah. from soap. We're, I've yeah. never heard that. It's funny. It's a very Jamaican thing. These, yep. the, you know, they call them maxims. Yes. You know, my parents would always say things like, um, a creaky door never falls off its hinges. You know, that like kind of, if you're sick, your whole, you know, on and off, like they're, they're not the people who die young. It's the people who are healthy, <laughs> you know, right. or, you know, you've made your bed and now you can lie in it <laughs> you know, if you do something yeah. terrible. Yeah. These, you know, kind of incredible, I don't think we use them. I mean, we have the kind of, you know, chuck another shrimp on the barbie and those kinds yeah. of things. But um, it's a very West Indian thing to use these weird but analogies. But I love that yeah. one is great. Yeah. Soap. Yeah, it's yeah, cleanliness or yeah. or scrubbing or or trying to remove. Mm. It's really really wonderful. Can I just talk a little bit about your children's books? Mm. Um, uh, you, I know you're inspired to write. When we say Black Lives Matter, uh, you part of the inspiration was sort of trying to work out how you write about something that is dark. Uh, and, and capturing sorrow and injustice, but also balance it with beauty and hope and resilience. How do you do that? Because that's a, that's a really difficult task, isn't it? And is that something that you think about with all of your work, that balance? Yeah, it's something that I think about a lot. I think whether a piece of work... I mean, some pieces of work, I think, whether it's a poem or whether it's a kid's book, they don't necessarily need that light or need that hope. You know, sometimes you just decide this is a really heavy topic and it's really dark and the beauty has to be in the words and in the yep. delivery. I'm not going to make it easy for the reader. Yep. And there are other times, like with when we say Black Lives Matter, where... You know, it's a picture book, and even though it's a book that can be read by kids and adults, you know, it's 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 a it's really an illustrated poem, but because it's in a children's book form, I knew it would be put into the hands of, of small people. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you have a really difficult conversation that's about inequality, police brutality, yeah. racism, that 
is okay for a five-year-old, but that also that a 10-year-old will be able to get something yeah. out of. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot about, you know, colours and delivery. And, and for example, the poem Fridays in this book, um, you know, as opposed to being, there are a lot of poems in here that deal with climate change, but that one really is about the power and the strength of that Friday Strike for Climate movement. Yep. So choosing the moment that the poem was going to happen um, and sometimes making that a moment of triumph can be a great way, I guess, of, of adding that light. Yes. It really is a, a, it's a balancing act and it's it not easy. The other one, thing I wanted to ask you about was writing in the voices of others, which, of course, is it, it's a sort of hot topic at the moment and I suppose it has been for a few years now. Can we tell someone else's story? And I read about you performing a story uh, as part of your... Uh, you were part of Writers for Refugees. You performed a story based on the writings of someone who was incarcerated, an mm. asylum seeker. Can you tell us how that came about and how it felt? Yeah, that's actually occurred a couple of times. So once was I was part of a group called Writing Through Fences yep. um, and run by an incredible woman, Janet Galebraith, who um, really the idea was incarcerated people who are in immigration detention centres would be able to have a dialogue with um, Australian writers, yep. you know, whether it's getting feedback on work, basically whatever, whatever dialogue they wanted. And at the launch of this um, scheme, it wasn't really an organisation, it was just kind of an idea, I suppose, which we had it up at Trades Hall, um, the organiser said, I'm going to give you the writings of, I think it was 50, 50 people from, who are currently in immigration detention centres. And you need to make a work out of it, you know? So whether it's kind of picking a line from here or picking a paragraph from here or... And they'd kind of all... She said, they'll, you know, they'll be watching. You've all got their consent to do this. And that was kind of both an excruciating thing to do. You know, how do you edit work like that? Yeah. How do you choose um, what voices get heard or who gets heard? And also just the weight of actually... Um, Wearing that person's words, yeah. you know, when it when you're t they're talking about mental health issues, talking about, you know, just living an incarcerated life, not knowing when mm. you're going to get out, um, and that was like I think it took me quite a long time to get over that. Um, and the second incident, actually, which I did twice, was um, the Saturday paper published a letter from Baruz Buchani when he was incarcerated on, on Manus Island, and. Um, they wanted to have a reading of it. And of course he couldn't give a reading of it himself. And so the editor said, will you come and give a reading at this at um, Mort, the Morthouse Theatre in the courtyard because we want it to be publicly proclaimed. Yeah. And that as well was kind of, um, it's an extraordinary piece of writing as is his book, No Friend But The Mountains. Um, and I had some dialogue with his editor who said, you know, he's really looking forward to this, he wants it to be read in public, and so um, I read that. And it's funny because I had actually said to er um, Eric afterwards, I don't think I, I, don't think I want to do that again, you know? Really? It was like... Um, because it's, you almost feel like um, you're experiencing what you're talking about, you know, yeah, the course. weight of it. And also it almost felt like... I just wanted him to be there, yeah. and to be able to read it. And but that, it's a that willingness. massive yeah. responsibility as well. Yeah, and then <laughs> as soon as I said that, um, Pan America Festival in New York um, contacted me and said, we want you to come and read it at the opening. And, you know, Baruz has said, well, I really want this to be read. It's going to give an international audience. You know, Colson Whitehead was reading at the opening. Oh, wow. So I was like... Okay, <laughs> now I'm going to read this in New York. So that was kind of the opening piece did. for the for the Pan America America, you went to America yeah, festival um, to do it. Yeah, yes. and just I think the reality of being a body that's free, standing in for someone who's literally not, was such a profound. Yes. Um, you know, you're just hyper aware that where you are and where the person who's written it is at that point in time. What was um, his reaction? Um, did you get was, to, to speak to him? I haven't. I didn't get to speak to him at the oh. time. No. Um, 
but you know he emailed and said you know he was really glad it was read and, and really grateful and, and yeah it was quite extraordinary um and so it's the double thing of you know having that you know i want to be able to promote the voices of people who are yes unable to deliver work themselves yeah. um and at the same time you know the objective is to, to have them there delivering their yeah, work of course. so you're just aware of the gap between yes. the reason why you're there and the gap between that happening yeah. but what about then that this idea of writing using another voice i think i i read that you said you wouldn't necessarily speak in uh, the voice of a First Nations person from Australia, mm. but you would create characters. I mean, no, I think, you know, there are some things that I definitely wouldn't do as an author. And I think the issue really is, as an author, you need to be open to criticism. Right? You know, there's this whole censorship debate as like, you know, you can't write that and you can't do that. Anyone can write whatever they want yes. and people do, you know, all kinds of things get published. But I think the issue is being upset when people say you've done it wrong. So I think for anything I try and put out, I think, and certainly with Foreign Soil, um, which is mainly an African diaspora collection, short fiction collection, yep. there were stories that when I sat down with the stories that would go in the collection, I, was, I can't put this story in because this is something I wrote to see if I could write the story. Yes. I'm not 100%. Could I stand behind this? You know, if someone questioned me about it, could yeah. I actually stand behind it? And I think as a writer, you know, my process is to try and do no harm. You know, that by publishing this story, yeah. am I harming anyone? Am I, um, I suppose, doing the opposite of what I'm trying to um, achieve? But at the same time, fiction is fiction. You know, I have a very specific family background. If I was to write only characters who are Australian born and have Afro-Caribbean heritage, yes. then that would be a very narrow thing. It so it's, it's about, you know, the integrity, it's about the research, it's about the openness to have a dialogue about it. And I think where people have gotten into trouble, um, and by trouble I mean have been criticised, is in their response to people saying, look, I don't, yeah. I don't actually think you did this yeah. right or, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the same time, there will always be criticisms, you know, no matter what you write. Yeah. And certainly having my book on this, a school syllabus um, for four years and, you know, touring through schools and classrooms, you know, kids all the time will say, you know, there's a particular story, Harlem Jones in Foreign Soil, that's about a young black British teenager. And he had... They, join up and they go to the Tottenham riots together and he has this friend, Toby, who's this kind of lanky um, Anglo-English kid. And this kid, this African-Australian kid kind of said, Miss, it's always weird when they call you Miss because you're not a teacher, <laughs> why is Harlem friends with Toby? I just don't think they should be friends. And it was a real, this real wow. kind of, he wouldn't be friends with him. Like he just, they just would not be friends. I don't get it. And out of the, this whole story that's kind of this political landscape of black Britain. And, and how and do you respond unrest. to that? What, just having the question of why? You know, why do you think that? And, and it's really interesting, yeah. the perceptions of... Um, yeah. And, you know, there's another story in the book where, in Foreign Soil, where um, there's a mother who kind of gives up her child or delivers her child to another family member because he's in danger in the home and he's in danger from his father and, and the broader conservative community they're yeah. in. And, you know, at this one particular school, the kids were obsessed with the mother's decision to give the child up. And this story is so vast and about so many political things, but because this is a room of teenagers, it was kind of, yeah. did she do the right thing? And they want to be judgmental about parents. Wow. And, and so, yeah, this idea that once the story is on the page, you can't control what people no. think of it, how they critique it, how they digest it. You kind of just have to go, I did my job as well as I could and if people want to engage with it, you know, we'll talk about it. Um, because it's, it becomes a living thing in other people's yeah. lives. You know, it's kind of your job's 
your job's done. But, and yeah. I suppose that is a little added pressure, or it could be mm. if you start second guessing yourself and, and thinking, mm. oh, how are people going to respond to that? Mm. The time is marching. I know mm-hmm. that there'll be a few people who would like to ask you a couple of questions. Could we have one more reading? Uh. Um, maybe something, you know, a little shorter, but it's up to you. Uh, okay. And then we'll. Um, We'll organise some questions. I think we've got some microphones that can travel around. I might read Fridays, just because I mentioned it early. Fridays. On Fridays, our children are bursting train carriages backpacked full of hope, wielding placards, bedroom made from flattened cornflake boxes and upcycled tomato steaks. On Fridays, our children raise melodic voices meant for playing tag or jump rope and take to the streets in every city, millions strong and begging us to know. In the empty classrooms, silence echoes round initial etched desks and lockers left open spill crumpled science notes. On Fridays, our kids are forced to become adults. On the ball court, a lone grey hoodie hangs abandoned from the hoop. Every week, our children sacrifice one-fifth of their dreams and on Fridays, they become exactly who we need, marching with their arms around each other's tiny shoulders and their iPhones held up viral high. They are brave enough to defy instruction, sure enough to face the future and smart enough to know their minds. If they save the world or not. On Fridays, our children tried. Beautiful. Thank you, Maxine, for for reading to us. Now, I'm just going to do that so I can have a little look. Uh, Maybe, oh, there's one. Yeah, I think we'll just do it by the time-honoured method of a hand up and we'll get the microphone down to you as quickly as possible. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about some of the poets that really inspire you um, and I was interested given the children's books you've written and obviously having a lot of interaction with young people through your work being studied by them in um, what work for young people, either young children or young adults that um, you really admire either from your childhood or from now. Oh, great question. Um, work for young people. Um, Angie Thomas is incredible, um, The Hate You Give, um, and she's got a couple of others. Kwame Alexander, who's an African-American writer who writes verse novels, um, which sounds like they'd be difficult for kids to digest, but um, the crossover is kind of a basketball verse novel, if you've got boys. Um, And there's also a novel he's written called Solo, which is about um, another verse novel for teenagers. And it's kind of about the son of a rock star, this kind of angst-ridden son of a rock star and this this life that he lives trying to kind of come out from the shadow of his father. Um, I think it's always very difficult to get get teenage boys to read, so they're great suggestions. Um, In terms of kids' books... Ah, oh, there's so much great stuff going on in Australia at the moment. Um, anything that Magabala Books is putting out, um, books like uh, Briggs's Our Home, Our Heartbeat in terms of picture books. I love that Little People Big Dreams, the non-fiction series where they kind of have, you know, Josephine Baker and Maya Angelou and then tell their lives in, in picture books. Yeah, there'd be some suggestions for kids. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? There's one in the... Yep, that's right. How important do you think a title is to a poem? Oh, Oh, that's a great question. (laughs) Titles are everything. Oh, my goodness. And it's, it's, you know, sometimes you... You know, I know, I know kind of for some authors a title isn't a big deal. It's just kind of you, you kind of whack anything on. But I do a lot of like, has anyone else titled their book this? Is there a movie that's, you know, you kind of don't want to double up on a book that's already really popular. Yeah. Um, How Decent Folk Behave um, 
pulling that out of that poem something sure happened at the very last minute this manuscript went through really so many it was titled so many different things what were some of the other titles um i think at one stage it was titled something sure so the title of the poem yep. um it was titled when the decade broke for a while so i think all different titles of poems and then when i was editing it i just got to that line how decent folk behave and i was like wow that's the essence of this collection totally. really um and it kind of hit but yeah some and it's that weird thing of i go through so many titles but when you get the right one even for a poem itself you just know yeah. it's kind of like okay this is this is the yeah. one um and some of these poems were previously published in the saturday paper when i was writing for them um and sometimes so some of the titles have actually been changed you know, like i couldn't title it what i wanted to then so i changed the oh, title really? <laughs> because it's kind of in a, it's it's seen as news coverage oh, so I it's see. kind of like we want this poem to be about yes. home to bill wheeler so we'll call it home to be you know kind of signaling to the readers yeah. what it's about um whereas you had a little bit more freedom yeah yeah that's yeah. a great title though yeah. i reckon i think it's just absolute wonderful how decent folk behave but yeah i obsess over titles there we go <laughs> the hand is up over on the oh wait a minute in here at, on the far side oh okay we'll come to you <laughs> <laughs> good on you thank you hi um the poems that you read tonight were all quite topical and naturally political um and i wanted to ask how you reconcile the shelf life of these poems given that they respond to the time that we're living in or if that's something that you deal with later? Yeah, I, I think there's a misconception that, and, and I think this is a weird thing about COVID, I've expected a lot of COVID literature to come out. You know, like surely there's a, a novel to be written about share housing during COVID and, you know, that flatmate who's breaking the rules and you have to interact with them in the kitchen and, but, you know, maybe it will take longer for them to come out. Yeah. But, I do think a lot of writers steer away from anchoring something in a particular time. A specific time. specific time. Um, but it's weird because, you know, The Hate Race, my memoir, is obviously it's a childhood memoir. It takes place during the 80s and 90s. Foreign Soil, you know, there's a story set during the 2011 Tottenham riots. There's a story set in Villawood Detention Centre that, you know, they're all set really at particular moments in time. And in a weird way, it's given the book longevity as opposed to limiting its shelf life. Mm. Because when you're studying it, you're actually learning, um, you know, and especially when you're talking yeah. about kids, you know, there's one story there that's set in the British Black Panther movement of the 1960s. Um, you're just opening all of these pathways. You know, it can be studied as sociology. It can be studied as political commentary. It can be studied as poetry. It can be... Um, and, I, and I had a recent review, weirdly, in The Australian, where, where they said, you know, if anyone wants to know what this time was ever like, they need to read this book. So it's this weird thing of, you know, I always do have that concern. The answer is yes. You know, I always think, is this really going to be read in 10 years' time? But the answer is that it's, it's a history book. Yeah. You know, it's a book of poetry, but it's also a book of history. So I don't think that really will have impact on... on negatively on the yeah. way that it's read. I think it's important that you anchor it to a specific time. Mm. I think it's um, it gives it a, another dimension. One here. There we go. Yep. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much. We've just finished up our third year with Foreign Soil on our Year 12 oh. um, literature <laughs> list. It's just been amazing. And just doing orientation with our kids going into year 12 next year and I said that I was coming here tonight and um, they asked they actually want to know from the collection which one is your favorite oh, good question. wow good question um, oh, I love Harlem Jones you know, I loved writing that story. It's such a fast-paced story. And the strange thing is, so the book is on the syllabus, but I know that story is not on the syllabus. And uh, the title story, Foreign Soil, is also not on the syllabus. Yeah. And yeah. why does that happen? Why, how do you take a couple of stories out? Oh, look, I have my 
suspicions. You know, ha- Harlem Jones is about a rioting teenager with a <laughs> Molotov cocktail, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, the weird thing is when I do school visits, that's the one... St- of course, they read it first. Because yeah. it's like, oh, we'll read the ones we're not, 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 not supposed to read first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other one... The other one's a strange one because it deals with domestic violence, you know, kind of intimate yep. partner violence. And... I think that's potentially why. Um, But I know there are other short story collections on the syllabus where there are certain stories that are not on. And sometimes it can be that they only need a certain number or it can be that it's too... They can consider it too difficult or... um, But, yeah, Harlem Jones, definitely. I love writing that and I loved writing um, Gaps in the Hickory. I think Gaps in the Hickory could have been a novel. I kind of finished it and went, I could keep going... Um, (laughs) Yeah. All right, take that back. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. There was one hand that was up. Last question. Last question. What about just a comment? Firstly, I think Fridays are so well observed, just like the rest of you, the poems that you've read. But I, wonder, I have a fantasy that maybe your prologue could one day be read in Parliament <laughs> to just change the national dialogue from business models KPIs to something, you know, resembling a government doing its job in a very humanistic, collective way, instead of just acceding to the business community, full stop. Will you do that? <laughs> yep, we'll pass that on. What a. <laughs> and, yeah. Thank you. Great. Great. Perfect ending. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, what a great privilege it's been. So a big hand, please, for Maxine Benabar-Clark. Thank you, Maxine. Now, I know there'll be a little bit of uh, selling and signing. Yeah, yeah, up happy the back. to sign books. So, yeah. <laughs> look, I'm sure you can uh, wander up there. I also need to let you know that Mary Martin Bookshop, are our booksellers for this conversation, we thank them, we encourage you to purchase uh, Maxine's work there, uh, How Decent Folk Behave and all her other work. But also we say a huge thank you to all the bookshops of Melbourne. We need to support them. We need to uh, keep ideas uh, up front and wonderful ideas like uh, Maxine. So thank you very much. Thank you to the Wheeler Centre. Thank you to Veronica, to Virginia and to the Tex and all the other wonderful people. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.